down my sword and shield, way down. Down by the riverside, way down. Down by the riverside, way down. Down by the riverside, gonna lay down my sword and shield, way down. Down by the riverside, gonna study war no more. There's their way down. Down by the riverside. Way down. Down by the riverside. Way down. Down by the riverside. Gonna meet all my oppressors there. Way down. Down by the riverside. Gonna study war no more. No, no, no. Ain't gonna. Good afternoon. My name is Clyde Ford, and I would like to welcome you, elected officials, council people, members of the community, friends and neighbors, to the 20th anniversary commemoration of Martin Luther King Jr. Day here in the city of Bellingham. You know, an anniversary is always a good time to think about what's gone on in the past and to think about what's coming in the future. And it's a good time to, to look at doing things a little different. And one of the things that I have wanted to do for a number of years that I finally got to do this year is to have a co-host with this event. And so I would like to introduce my co-host to you. Many of you know her for her work for five and a half years as the executive director of the Whatcom Peace and Justice Center. Some of you may not know that uh, Marie Marchand now has a new job in Skagit County as the executive director of Friendship House, which is the largest organization in Skagit uh, um, for emergency shelter and serving food. And I just heard her say that they serve 5,000 meals a month. So I would like you to welcome to the podium with me, Marie Marchand. Thank you. Thank you, Marie. And before we go on, I would like to take a moment and ask you to join me in a moment of silence for our Lummi brothers and sisters who have recently experienced a number of deaths in their family. I'm so glad that through all of that, they were still able to join us here. But in a spirit of fellowship and friendship, I wonder if we could just take a moment of silence so that our hearts who reach out to our brothers and sisters in Lummi who are going through this time of grief. Thank you. 
There are a number of people that I would like to thank at the beginning of this program because I'm afraid I'll forget to by the end. And I've learned over the years as a host that if you start by thanking people and you remember during the program you've forgotten some people, you can do that at the end. Whereas if you thank somebody at the end, then you've forgotten, then you get some strange stares as the program ends. I'd like to first thank the organizing committee for this event. You know, I may be the talking head, but I am not the person who organizes this event any longer. And the organizing committee consists of your neighbors and community members, people like Terry Borneman, Gail Smedley, Cynthia Zephyratis, Doug Banner, Dennis Lane, um, and I'm sure there's somebody I forgot, Joseph Garcia, Anita Boyle, and whomever I've forgotten, somebody in the audience, please whisper their name out or pass me their name on a card so I can uh, thank you at the end. I'd also like to thank some of our sponsors who make this possible, uh, the Northwest Labor Council, Community Food Co-op, uh, Markets, Inc. And again, I'm sure there's a sponsor I may have forgotten, but if I have, uh, somebody let me know about that. Without the support of folks like this in the community, uh, we would not be able to make this day happen. So thank you very much. I'd like to start our program by uh, introducing to you the mayor of Bellingham, Washington, Dan Pike. Thank you. And you know, I have to say what an honor it is to be mayor of a city that fills this room every year for this celebration. And I want to start by thanking all the people. I'm not going to try to name the names because I know a few of them, but not all of them. But everyone that has anything to do with this, thank you, thank you. This is part of why Bellingham is such a great place to live. I just want to take a couple of minutes here just to say that you know, there were events the last couple weeks that I think horrified many of us and brought back memories of other bad events in our past. And I think, you know, when, we, when events like what happened in Arizona happen, we, we can sort of pull away and cringe or we can take action. And action doesn't mean fighting back physically necessarily, but it means thinking about how we contribute either to solving the problem, making the world better, or we contribute to leading us down a path that is worse. And I think about um, the lack of civility that we've sometimes had the last few years in our country, particularly around politics. And, and I think Dr. King is an absolutely appropriate person to think about in a time like this, because Dr. King understood that civility doesn't mean obedience, and in fact, he was one of the more foremost practitioners of civil disobedience that the world has known and showed how to use that very effectively. But I think that civility is critical for us moving forward as a society. So I guess what I would like to challenge everyone to do is to think about when you're interacting with people who disagree with you, remember that we're all human beings underneath that, and sometimes if we can find a way to have civil discourse, we can find a way to open hearts and minds to hearing the messages that they're having trouble receiving at times from us, and that sometimes we're having trouble receiving from them. You know, Dr. King said that if it's an eye for an eye, at the end of the day, we'll all be blind. And I think that all of us know that this world would be a much different place if Dr. King had not been taken from us so young. And we lost great vision with his passing. And every time somebody is taken violently from us, taken too soon from us, we lose a piece of the vision that could help us get to a better place. So let's all commit to working on being civil, on loving each other fully, which doesn't mean accepting faults, but working to try to address those faults and also working equally or even more hard at addressing the faults that we ourselves bring to the table. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for all that you do to make this a better community. And with that, I'm going to keep my remarks brief, as I said, and pass it on to others who have a lot of important things to say. Thank you.
It is a special honor to be here as co-host today, and it's a special honor for me to introduce Daryl Hilaire. He is the director of the Lummi Youth Academy, and I had the privilege of working with some of Daryl's students and with Daryl himself this summer on a Martin Luther King Jr. nonviolence training. And it was during this time that I saw the love that he has brought to that academy. And when I first met him five and a half years ago, it was at um, the Whatcom Human Rights Task Force Award when he received that award. And he talked about the vision of building this. And so one of the privileges of being in this community for all of us is that we've seen his vision come to fruition. And it is filled with love. I would sit in that office and children would come in and write, I love you, Daryl, thank you, on the whiteboard. And so we are very lucky to have him as a spiritual community leader. So please help me welcome Daryl. CM, Nostalgia CM. Today we come to you in gratitude for honoring us with this time with you today, thanking you for including us in your celebration, thanking you for welcoming us back to where we used to live, where we moved from 155 years ago. And we come here in friendship, each and every one of you, our respected elders, our youth, we cherish this friendship today and the days ahead. And we come to you today in reflection, reflection of this 20 years together, the good words that we heard from our leaders here, the beautiful songs, and the respect that is built between each and every one of us today and all the days that we've gathered on this day of celebration of Martin Luther King Jr. And we come today in the spirit of forgiveness, forgiving you for any kind of hurt that we have received from you through the years. And we come today for forgiveness from you and what hurts that we have caused you, any burdens that you have carried, we hope that are lifted today and these days ahead. And every day we try to do this for one another in the spirit of Aunt G, in the spirit of the students from the Lummi Youth Academy, and especially in the spirit of Jackie and Isidore Tom and their descendants today that are singing this song for each and every one of us. Heishka CM and Estelicha, Heishka.
Thank you, Roger and the chorus. Uh, I like to encourage everybody to move toward the center and the front so that people at the sides have some space to sit. And also, I didn't mention this before, but if you haven't, would you make sure that your cell phones are either off or on buzz? Thank you. And I'm really liking that strategy of uh, thanking everybody in the beginning, because I already got some cards and some notices about who I didn't thank. And, the one, and, and I want to thank also the city of Bellingham for um, making this day possible. And really, that thanks goes right back to the beginning of this event and to our next speaker. Because it was 20 years ago um, in November that, uh, or maybe it was September, I can't remember when it was, but it was sometime in the fall, that I and Renee Collins, who was then the president of the NAACP, walked into uh, the next speaker's office, then Mayor Tim Douglas, and we sat down across from Tim, and Tim said, what can I do for you? And I said, Tim, the nation celebrates Martin Luther King Jr. Day, the state celebrates Martin Luther King Jr. Day, but the city doesn't. We need to change that. And it was because of who Tim was and some other the politics that were going on at the time with labor that everything seemed to be a perfect storm of convergence that we were able to actually have the city honor Martin Luther King Jr. Day. And it was also a reminder to me of the wonderful nature of the community that we live in, where two people can walk into the mayor's office and say, we got to get something done. And you've got somebody with vision and clout there who gets it done. I mean, can you think of doing that in New York City? You probably wouldn't even get in to the reception area in the mayor's office. But here in Bellingham, we have that kind of community that makes it possible for things like this to happen. And so I want to welcome to the podium and ask you to welcome to the, po to the podium someone who also should get the credit for this day happening now 20 years ago and for the last 20 years, and that is the former mayor of Bellingham, Tim Douglas. Twenty years, and boy, is it tough to remember <laughs> everything that's happened because so much has happened since. You know, uh, Clyde, as I was thinking back to the 20 years ago and, and what Martin Luther King Day has meant to Bellingham, I was most struck by an experience that I had as mayor that occurred in 1988. Uh, Eighteen other people and I went back to the Russian Far East to discuss with a city there, Nahotka, the possibility of becoming a sister city. And this was before the fall of the Soviet Union. Cold War stuff was really going strong. And it was a real memorable trip. One of the strongest memories I have, though, was uh, at a school that we visited. We spent a couple of hours there being entertained by the children in that school of all ages, from kindergarten through 12. and uh, meeting with others in the community there and really regaling in the possibility of two countries that had such different perspectives at that point coming together and working together. And then at the conclusion of that, when we sat down for tea and cookies and the usual accoutrements of a good Russian uh, visit, our teacher friends there asked us to clasp hands with them, which we all did in a big circle. And they asked us to join them in singing a song of inspiration for them. We shall overcome. And all of us together sang, and I think there were many tears in the room at that time, we shall overcome. And I realize that what really Martin Luther King is all about is the ability of people throughout the world, throughout our country, to join hands and to recognize the importance of every individual, no matter what their background may be, no matter what their beliefs may be. It is that common bond that brings about the best in our community. And so as I thought back to that day and back trying to remember back 20 years ago when we started this because of the many wonderful celebrations that we have had since then, 
I came to think once again, what was Martin Luther King Day really about? Why did we agree to do this? Why? One, it recognized the value of every human being, every resident of Bellingham, no matter what their background. Two, it reignited and rekindles every year the enthusiasm, the eagerness we have for life and for a better future, and reminding us of the commitment that we all have to make if we want this place to be the kind of community that anyone would enjoy living in and being proud to live in, and also one that is characterized by justice and fairness to all. That is an important part of Martin Luther King Day. And the third part that I think is more recent, frankly, a realization on my part, and that is good things are rarely easy to come by. And so when we commit ourselves to make this community the best we possibly can and remind ourselves on every Martin Luther King Day and I hope every other day of the year that no matter how hopeful we are about the future, it takes hard work to get there and we need to really have the courage and energy and thoughtfulness to proceed after it. So this may be the 20th year but I realize it's really, for all of us, only a beginning because there are many generations to come, many generations to honor and live the call of Martin Luther King. Thank you. Our next speaker is Gail Smedley, and she is a middle school teacher in Ferndale. She's a professional storyteller whose stories relay peace and justice and the value of living as one humanity, and she tells stories to people of all ages. She's an active community volunteer. I'm sure many of you know her, and she is also a recipient of the Human Rights Award given out by the Whatcom Human Rights Task Force. Please help me welcome Gail. Normally, I'd be standing in front of you ready to share a story, perhaps one I wrote or one, a folktale from around the world. But today, I'd like to share Representative John Lewis's story. I'd like to actually read to you an excerpt from his wonderful memoir on the movement called Walking with the Wind. This little story has nothing to do with the national stage or historic figures or monumental events. It is a simple story, a true story, about a group of young children, a wood frame house, and a windstorm. The children were my cousins, about a dozen of them all told, along with three siblings and me. I was four years old at the time, too young to understand there was a war going on over in Europe and out in the Pacific as well. The grown-ups called it a world war, but I had no idea what that meant. The only world I knew was the one I stepped out into each morning, a place of thick pine forests and white cotton fields and red clay roads winding around my family's house in our little corner of Pike County, Alabama. We had just moved that spring onto some land my father had bought, the first land anyone in his family had ever owned, 110 acres of cotton and corn and peanut fields, along with an old but sturdy three-bedroom house, a large house for that part of the county, the biggest place for miles around. It had a well in the front yard and pecan trees out back and muscadine grapevines growing wild in the woods all around us, our woods. My father bought the property from a local white businessman who lived in the nearby town of Troy. The total payment was $300 cash. That was every penny my father had to his name, money he had earned the way almost everyone we knew made what money they could in those days, by tenant farming. My father was a sharecropper, 
planting, raising, and picking the same crops that had been grown in that soil for hundreds of years by tribes like the Choctaws and Chickasaws and the Creeks, Native Americans who were working this land long before the place was called Alabama, long before black or white men were anywhere to be seen in those parts. Almost every neighbor we had in those woods was a sharecropper, and most of them were our relatives. Nearly every adult I knew was an aunt or an uncle, every child my first or second cousin. That included my Uncle Rabbit and Aunt Seneva and their children, who lived about a half mile or so up the road from us. On this particular afternoon, it was a Saturday, I'm almost certain, about 15 of us children were outside my Aunt Seneva's house, playing in her dirt yard. The sky began clouding over. The wind started picking up. Lightning flashed far off in the distance. And suddenly, I wasn't thinking about playing anymore. I was terrified. I had already seen what lightning could do. I'd seen fields catch fire after a hit to a haystack. I'd watched trees actually explode when a bolt of lightning struck them, the sap inside rising to an instant boil, the trunk swelling until it burst its bark. The sight of those strips of pine bark snaking through the air like ribbons was both fascinating and horrifying. Lightning terrified me, and so did thunder. My mother used to gather us around her whenever we heard thunder, and she'd tell us to hush. Be still now, because God was doing his work. That was what thunder was, my mother said. It was the sound of God doing his work. But my mother wasn't with us on this particular afternoon. Aunt Seneva was the only adult around, and as the sky blackened and the wind grew stronger, she herded us all inside. Her house was not the biggest place around, and it seemed even smaller with so many children squeezed inside. Small and surprisingly quiet. All of the shouting and laughter that had been going on earlier outside had stopped. The wind was howling now, and the house was starting to shake. We were scared. Even Aunt Seneva was scared. And then it got worse. Now the house was beginning to sway. The wood plank flooring beneath us began to bend. And then a corner of the room started lifting up. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. None of us could. The storm was actually pulling the house toward the sky with us inside it. That was when Aunt Seneva told us to clasp hands. Line up and hold hands, she said. And we did as we were told. Then she had us walk as a group towards the corner of the room that was rising. From the kitchen to the front of the house we walked, the wind screaming outside, sheets of rain beating on the tin roof. Then we walked back in the other direction as another end of the house began to lift. And so it went, back and forth, 15 children walking with the wind, holding that trembling house down with the weights of our small bodies. More than a half a century has passed since that day, and it has struck me more than once over those many years that our society is not unlike the children in that house, rocked again and again by the winds of one storm or another, the walls around us seeming at times as if they might fly apart. It seemed that way in the 1960s, at the height of the Civil Rights Movement, when America itself felt as if it might burst at the seams. So much tension, so many storms. But the people of conscience never left the house. They never ran away. They stayed. They came together, and they did the best they could, clasping hands and moving toward the corner of the house that was the weakest. And then another corner would lift, and we would go there. And eventually, inevitably, the storm would settle, and the house would still stand. 
But we knew another storm would come, and we would have to do it all over again. And we did. And we still do, all of us, you and I, children holding hands, walking with the wind. That is America to me. Not just the movement for civil rights, but the endless struggle to respond with decency, dignity, and a sense of brotherhood to all the challenges that face us as a nation, as a whole. That is the story, in essence, of my life, of the path to which I've been committed since I turned from a boy to a man, and to which I remain committed today. It is a path that extends beyond the issue of race alone and beyond class as well, and gender, and age, and every other distinction that tends to separate us as human beings rather than bring us together. That path involves nothing less than the pursuit of the most precious and pure concept I have that has guided me like a beacon ever since, a concept called the beloved community. That concept ushered me into the heart of the most meaningful and monumental movement of this past American century. We need it to steer us all where we deserve to go in the next.
Thank you, Roger and the chorus. Uh, our next speaker is somebody who also has uh, a legacy that goes back right to the beginning days of this particular commemoration and really was the person who was responsible for resurrecting this uh, community commemoration when it looked like it might die. And I remember it was back in, oh, the late 90s, I think it was, Terry, that uh, you called me and said, you know, we've got to take back the day. <laughs> and uh, Terry and I did, and Terry's been involved ever since, and so I, I want to welcome to the podium uh, City Councilman Terry Bornerman and my friend, Thank you. It is a great privilege to be able to speak to you today on this 20th anniversary of Bellingham's Martin Luther King Jr. celebration. With the shooting of Representative Gifford in Tucson, you know, we're again reminded of some of our violence past and the nature of our culture that many times glorifies guns and violence, things that Dr. King abhorred. Now, I had already written my remarks for today reflecting on whether we were making progress towards Dr. King's uh, dream of a blessed community or if his dreams were becoming that impossible dream you know, although I'm much more saddened than the weeks preceding that event, I'm still hopeful for our community and for our country and that we will continue moving forward. This 20th anniversary has given me an opportunity to look back at where we were 20 years ago and to look at what has changed. With 20 years of talking about and celebrating Dr. King's dream, you know, are we any closer to being that beloved community today. You know, Bellingham has not always been an open, welcoming community, especially if you were not white. You know, this is a community whose past includes the KKK parading uh, down the streets of Bellingham, where the Chinese and the Sikhs were run out of town. Our treatment of the people of the First Nations has not always been as brother to brother or as equal government to equal government. And against that kind of a background, you know, getting recognition of Martin Luther King Day as a holiday showed great growth of Bellingham as a community. Looking out today, I see a number of folks who were with us at City Hall 20 years ago. I gotta ask you, how many of you that were there would have dared believe that 20 years later we would have a man like Barack Obama elected as president? You know, I might have dreamed this, but I never would have believed it. And I gotta ask you, how many of you that were there would have dared believe that gay men and women would ever be able to serve openly in the military without fear of court-martial? Well, yeah, folks, we know now it's not only possible, but it's going to happen. We even know that in some parts of the country, two men and two women who love each other can marry with the same rights of others. Not something I would have believed 20 years ago. 20 years ago in Bellingham, we didn't have great organizations like the Whatcom Human Rights Task Force, the Whatcom Peace and Justice Center, Citizens to Citizens Development, sustainable connections, or the series of formal neighborhood organizations. These are all people working and volunteering to build a stronger, healthy community for all of us. In our community, we are making progress. We are moving forward. Things are changing, maybe not as fast as we'd like, but change is happening, especially amongst our young people. Today, at least with the youth and the youth that I get to know, they are finally learning to accept each other for who they are, not by their color, not by sexual orientation, not by age, not by age or not by what they're challenged by, but for who they are, by the content of their character. As, <laughs> 
As Dr. King so eloquently stated, I have a dream that my four children will one day live in a nation where we will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. This was one of the basis of his beloved community. This is a dream I carry in me for my beloved community, and I see in our youth, they're making this happen. You know, we still have lots of problems. There are still way too many people living in poverty and at the margins of poverty, and this may be the biggest problem for us to overcome. We still have throwbacks who cling to their outdated ideas of bigotry and sexism out of fear, and we may always have them, but we have to keep moving forward. You know, we witnessed the backlash against having a black president that is brought to the surface, you know, some latent racist views of some and embolden them in their actions. But I must believe this too will pass. Unfortunately, there's always pushback against change, but barriers have been broken and we must and will move forward. We have to hold on to our dream of a beloved community in our hearts and reach out to our neighbors and welcome them in to continue to have compassion for the pain experienced by those who act out of fear. For their pain must be great for them to act in such a way. It is hard individually to cause change on a federal level or even on a state level. But we can continue to change our part of the world, our community, one act at a time one person at a time. With this, we can make a difference. Here, you and I, we can make a difference here in Bellingham. We are moving forward towards Dr. King's dream of a beloved community here in our community through your work, through our collective dream. Bellingham will become and remain our beloved community, a community where we are defined by standing up for peace and justice and not for advocating war and violence, a community that works for economic justice for our citizens, a community that stands in support of environmental sustainability and where our children will be judged by the content of their character and not defined by their differences. This, my friend, is the dream that I hold and that I work for, and I hope you'll join me. Thank you. Don't you ever 